I'm John Rich. I'm a professor of health management and policy at the Dornsife Drexel School of Public Health. And I also co-direct the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice. I identify myself in those roles that I told you about, but I really come to this as a primary care doctor. And long ago, when I was in Boston, training at Boston City Hospital, actually my first job at Boston City Hospital, I began to see lots of young people who were coming into the hospital as victims of violence. And that was during a time when across the country we were seeing an epidemic of violence in cities like Boston, Philadelphia, New York, and others. And I began to understand that many of these young people, though they were treated as though they were criminals or they had done something to get themselves injured, that they were deeply traumatized, not only by the experience of getting shot or stabbed, but by the experience of getting care in a hospital where they were immediately judged or thought to um, have been involved in something that was made them responsible for their own injuries. And so I began to understand that in their own lives, what was driving the cycle of violence wasn't what everybody assumed it to be, that is, involvement in crime, but it really was their own traumatic experiences and the communities in which they lived that had been really abandoned by the police, by helpful services and the like. So I began to understand trauma in that context and realized that if we're going to do anything about trauma, particularly for those who are most at the margins of society, we really have to understand their humanity first and understand that trauma is what's driving the cycle of violence. You know, I'll never forget a particular time in Boston when I was in the emergency department visiting a colleague of mine who was an emergency medicine physician. And as we sat there, we heard over the speaker that a young person was coming in as a victim of violence. And I had the opportunity to stand back and to watch the encounter, to watch what happened in that moment. And what was remarkable was that there were these highly trained, highly capable medical professionals doing their best work in that moment. And yet in that moment, that young person, who was a Af young African-American male, seemed to disappear. He seemed to almost be non-existent. Now, that may be a necessary condition for treating these devastating wounds. And it is a, a triumph of modern medicine that we can do that. And yet there was something striking in the fact that they weren't talking to him and the fact that all of these things were happening to him without any explanation or any regard for him as a person. And I realize many of us experience that in the healthcare system, feeling a little bit like we lose ourselves when we walk in those doors. And yet for this young person, it seemed to be more than that because after they had rolled him out of the emergency department, the banter among the providers was really to assume that they knew why he had been shot to assume that he was just one of a number of people who were rolling through those doors at that time. And I began to see the connection between trauma and dehumanization, but also what happens in a medical system when providers themselves don't have the opportunity to process their trauma. I would say one other example is a young person who really became a mentor to me in understanding this. A young man named Roy Martin who, a brilliant young man, who really wanted to grow up as a bookworm, but had parents who themselves were highly traumatized and ultimately decided that they were going to prepare him to be for a life of crime, essentially. And he learned all the rules associated with that, such as winning justifies everything. That was the way he lived his life. And yet, as I began to know him, as he was in pre-release from state prison for an act of violence, I began to understand that issues of abandonment in his childhood, issues of feeling um, without a place, often feeling the victim of racism, fed much of the anger that led him to that place. I also began to understand, more acutely then, how our work can't really proceed unless we hear the voices of young people who are in these circumstances and honor those voices as truth. Even more, Roy is now a service provider. He's a leader in this area, helping young people. And I know that we can't do this work if we think about it as experts, talking to other experts, coming up with evidence-based practices. All those things, maybe those are important.
but it is actually the voices of people who've had the lived experience of violence and trauma that are going to be most valuable to us in public health and in practice in changing not the people, but the toxic circumstances in which many of these young people live. I at first was mostly humbled by it. I was humbled by my own lack of insight and knowledge, my own privilege that prevented me from having understood these issues themselves. I also began to recognize the role of race, the role of class and privilege in how these young people were treated. But I think there was also a sense that primary care was important for everybody else, but for them we needed violence prevention. And it came out in conversations, you'd actually say, what about primary care for them? People say, oh no, violence, um, violence prevention. So I had the opportunity to craft a clinic for young men, not young African-American men, not young victims of violence, but young men who tend not to make the transition from pediatrics or adult, adolescent medicine to adult medicine, and created a special portal, a special way of entering the healthcare system where we could pay attention to their trauma, have a community health worker there, uh, come with a sense of respect and a sense of empathy for their circumstances without judgment. And so that was a way of using the system to change. Now I will tell you, the limitation was that that work in itself didn't change the whole system. It became what you might think of as a workaround to the larger toxic system. And so when I had the opportunity to work with the health department, we began to think more intentionally about how do you prepare institutions to care for young people? What kind of training do providers need? What kinds of um, supports are there? And that's when I began to learn about work like Sandy Bloom's sanctuary model. And when I got to Philadelphia, the work that my colleague Ted Corbin's leading, that really began to think about larger hospital-based systems and how we could transform the care that young people get. I think more recently we've really thought about how to create trauma-informed systems to serve the needs of young people who are victims of violence. But I, I want to just blow this up a little bit and expand it to say that trauma-informed systems must also be culturally sensitive or culturally appropriate or to be more provocative they have to be anti-racist. That is to say it's not enough to think about trauma but we have to think about inequality, um, racism, sexism, homophobia, how those are playing out. Because these young people are more than just one thing. We, if we think about them only as traumatized or only as black or only as male, we fail to understand the complexity of their lives and what poverty, what um, living in communities that have been uh, divested of important resources, what that does. So we've had an opportunity to enter the trauma-informed conversation with a social justice lens. And that's an ongoing work. But as we think more about how you transform systems, we'll understand that you can't transform them only in one way. And the providers in those systems feel the weight of trauma, but they also feel the weight of the social determinants of health in their own lives, and the clients that they're serving do likewise. It's, it is a work in progress, though. Um, an ongoing work, not only within institutions like hospitals, but the, all of the, inst the agencies that come together. I think there's a process. I think we first have to, in order to transform thinking, we have to first help people understand what trauma is, help them think about race, racism, social justice, and then we have to help them understand how systems can change. One example of something that we've done that's been very well received has been to pull together something called the Citywide Injury Review Panel. We invite leaders, not just leaders with the title of leadership, but real on-the-ground leaders together and present the case of a young person who's been injured who is a client in Healing Hurt People. In that setting, we're able to talk about the trauma they've experienced not only in their own lives, but the trauma that they've experienced at the hands of institutions that are supposed to help them. And to think together about how we change those day-to-day -day practices, but also how we change policy. There's tremendous hunger for doing things in a way that works once the light bulb goes on. But until you understand trauma, 
the connection between the mind and the body and the context of inequality and social justice, it doesn't really make sense. So we're supporting that learning process over time. And I think we're beginning to see transformation, maybe small transformations in systems, but opening up the opportunity for larger transformation. In terms of what I would say to other leaders who are thinking about trauma-informed practice, especially in the context of public health, that we have got to do prevention on all levels. It is important that we focus on early childhood and make sure that young people grow up safe because we know from the ACEs study that early childhood adversity has a powerful impact on future health. So we have to begin with and think about young people, but we can't think about young people and infants and children in exclusion of their parents. Many of the young people who we see in Healing Her People have children. So how are we thinking about the, the life course perspective, particularly with regard to those who are impacted by violence? And I would say that we need prevention at all levels. We need not only those people, those young people who have never been exposed, sort of so-called primary prevention, but we also need to address the issues of those at risk and those who have already experienced violence because we know that violence feeds the cycle of violence. Trauma feeds the cycle of, of injury. So we have to think about this over the life course and we have to think about it in the long term. That they may, there may be short-term gains we can identify. We should be reducing post-traumatic stress. We should be reducing uh, depression. We should be creating opportunities for young people to function better. But we also have to stay in it for the long term and think about what it means to em embed in communities the resources that whole generations will need to, to thrive. One potential policy step for Philadelphia that would make sense in the current context. That would be to think about what is happening with the Affordable Care Act and the opportunity to provide Medicaid coverage or other coverage to many people who have not previously been covered. There's an opportunity to define what sorts of benefits are covered. And community-based services that help people access trauma-informed services are critical. We have an opportunity to think differently about how, what we pay for. So we, won't, we shouldn't just pay for medical care, pay for counseling, therapeutic mental health, but we should pay for all of the supports that are needed to keep people in those systems, including community health workers, including substance abuse treatment, in ways that are culturally appropriate, culturally sensitive, and uh, really recognize the social determinants of health. If we thought about Philadelphia as a trauma-informed city, I would think about all of the systems having a common language to speak with one another and being in an attitude of constantly looking at what they're doing to improve it to make it more trauma-informed and more socially just. Right now, there's a, just a natural tendency for individual efforts, whether those be city agencies, universities, not-for-profits, to only think in a very siloed way. Because of that, that's how clients or patients feel. That's how they experience it. And community members are often not part of that conversation. To the extent that we can have a common language, a common set of assumptions, and a common effort that is based in human dignity and social justice, then we'll, we'll see a natural infrastructure develop. And, and when we walk into a room like this injury review panel, we'll hear conversations that reference trauma, that reference race, that reference poverty in ways that can sort of hold all that complexity at the same time and translate it into very effective policy. That's the dream.